I'm Harriet Vanceball, Associate Professor of Medicine and Cardiologist from McMaster University, and I'm so delighted to have with me Dr. Jonas Oldgren and Dr. James Steffen, um, who are the principal investigators of the DAPA-MI trial. And we are here at HA 2023 to discuss the fascinating results of this landmark trial. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna start off by asking you the rationale for this study and um, keeping in mind the background evidence on the role of SGLT2 inhibitors in high-risk cardiovascular patients. Mm -hmm. So we've noticed that, um, that the outcomes of patients with myocardial infarction has improved considerably, but that improvement has plateaued in the last few years, and there is an unmet need to try to develop better secondary prevention therapies for patients with MI. And we found that we, when we looked at what can be the ideal or uh, what, would we do, what do we ideally want to achieve with a secondary prevention therapy, we realized that SGLT2 inhibition may provide most of those uh, outcome um, uh, measures that we want to improve upon, mm -hmm. uh, like heart failure hospitalization, risk for MI, uh, weight loss, developing diabetes. So a number of cardiometabolic outcomes could be improved by mm -hmm. SDH2 inhibition uh, in patients with MI. But then we also, of course, knew the results of the prior SDH2 inhibi inhibition trials, like uh, on heart failure. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided to exclude patients with chronic heart failure because they, we thought it was both not feasible, but also perhaps unethical to enroll mm -hmm. patients with chronic heart failure. Likewise, we excluded patients with diabetes because there's evidence that, that you should treat patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So, Likewise, we also excluded patients with severe renal dysfunction because mm -hmm. of evidence in, in that field. So we designed a protocol to enroll patients post-MI mm -hmm. without diabetes, without heart, chronic heart failure, uh, and without renal, poor renal function. Mm -hmm. um, with any degree of LV dysfunction after their MI, index MI. Um, so we had very few inclusion exclusion criteria in order to make the trial easy to enroll in. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about patients with chronic kidney disease in light of the DAPA CKD trial? Mm. Did you exclude those patients? We excluded patients with uh, uh, an EDFR below 20, so mm -hmm. fairly low cut point. Mm -hmm. uh, but we rolled those with above, about 20, so the, the mean uh, EDFR in the trial was about 80. Okay, so what was your primary outcome? Tell us about the hierarchy of outcomes within that composite. Yeah, so, so originally we aimed for a more traditional primary outcome. Uh, and so the composite of cardiovascular uh, death and hospitalization for heart failure. Mm -hmm. But we realized during the trial, but without any unblinding of data, just looking at the overall the totality of, of, of cardiovascular deaths and hospitalization for heart failure, that the event rates were lower than expected. Mm -hmm. In part, perhaps, due to the pandemic, because we started the study within the, in the middle of the pandemic, and, and we didn't hospitalize patients for heart failure. We tried to have patients staying out of the hospitals. So then we changed the design in February this year to uh, a primary hierarchical composite uh, analyzed with the wind ratio approach, which is mm -hmm. sort of novel. It's not really new. We have had this approach uh, published like 10 years ago. Uh, and we then pro had a, a hierarchical composite started with the worst outcome, which is, of course, death, mm -hmm. and then hospitalization for heart failure, followed by myocardial infarction, and then uh, atrial fibrillation, Diabetes, diabetes and uh, new heart association functional class and then weight loss. Mm -hmm. So, we have so a that was a large component. number of endpoints mm -hmm. within your primary. Why did you not choose to separate them into primary and then some of the surrogate measures as your secondary endpoints? Well, as yeah, well, you know, initially, as John said, we had a, a time to event analysis as mm. a primary death and, and heart failure hospitalization. But doing a win ratio analysis, the idea behind that is that all patients can contribute sure. with some outcomes. And so we listed what we th thought was important mm -hmm. for patients. And so we listed according to uh, perceived importance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to include also 
not only you know, hard endpoints, but also functional class, which ma may matter to patients. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted to include uh, body weight um, loss of my, more than 5% because that has been shown to be associated with you know, important clinical outcomes in the longer term. And so we thought all of those may, may be, may be, may be, may be important to mm -hmm. patients, and, uh, and then we ranked them accordingly. And, but our s key secondary endpoint excluded the body weight component because to avoid perhaps a criticism telling that, well, your drug or your strategy lowers body weight, which mm -hmm. may not be as important as the others. Sure. Uh, but that was also uh, met the uh, statistical significance. Okay, so tell us the treatment effect uh, on the primary outcome that was established <laughs> using the win ratio. Yeah. yeah, so the primary win ratio approach uh, so when you do the win ratio, you test, evaluate wins for, for the test to treatment arms, and then you, you, you do a, a, a ratio between those um, mm -hmm. wins. And we had a win ratio of 1.34 for the primary endpoint, mm -hmm. which means that there's a 34% higher likelihood of having a, have a better cardiometabolic outcome with apoglifosin versus placebo. Mm -hmm. Our key secondary outcome, excluding the body weight but keeping the other six components, <coughs> we had a win ratio um, of 1.2, so mm -hmm. a 20% higher likelihood of having a better uh, um, cardiometabolic outcome. Mm -hmm. And all of the first six components actually contributed, although the, the, the ones down the list, you know, reaching mortality, were fra fairly infrequent. Mm -hmm. uh, but they all contributed to the primary and key secondary outcomes. Okay. Uh, and did you find that, uh, you said they all contributed, but was there a single driver, do you think, of that win ratio? <coughs> well, drive, most of the drivers were in, in those that occurred most frequently, so mm -hmm. body weight reduction of 5%, neurocard functional class, uh, diabetes mellitus mm -hmm. were the key drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, but also heart failure hospitalization was a driver, although it occurred very infrequently. Mm -hmm. um, so those four, I would say, were the key drivers of the primary outcome. Yeah, and I think some of your exclusion criteria, as you pointed out, you know, um, did not allow you to, to, to retain a risk-enriched population that had the event rates that you were hoping for. Remind us of the follow-up duration. A mean follow-up of one year, a minimum mm -hmm. of three months. Mm -hmm. um, so a reasonable time frame. Yeah. Uh, if we had, you know, made a considerably larger trial, mm -hmm. uh, say 15 or 20,000 patients, if we had followed them for three years, right. uh, I think it's likely that we could have also uh, be able to find a reduction in, in the heart rate uh, outcomes. We mm -hmm. had a has a ratio of, one of 0 0.83 for heart failure hospitalization. Mm -hmm. We did not you know, find any benefit on SIVA mortality or all cause mortality, but the the event rates were so low, so it, you know, wide confidence intervals, so it's very hard to say any, see any trends uh, at all, but mm -hmm. considering the long-term treatment um, or large number of patients, it's not unreasonable to think that it could have also gone in that direction. But that uh, would, would have been a different, different trial. And perhaps we should also point out that there were no new safety signals, nothing. Right no safety concerns at all uh, in this population which has not been tested with SGLT2 inhibitors before. Mm -hmm. So that is, at least for me, a, an important result as well. We know that it's safe to start early with, with dapagliflozin after a myocardial infarction. Absolutely, and in light of the numerous indications, you know, that was one clinical setting in which DAPA had not been tested, so it gives us pause to consider that it's safe and the benefits are short-term. Um, across different clinical conditions. So uh, worth starting these drugs in hospital versus the standard of care. Before this trial would have been to start it if the patients had, you know, high risk features like heart failure or, you know, chronic kidney disease. And then of course, in people with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, we would start it. So your, your findings have really added to the literature about yet another indication in patients um, who have acute coronary syndrome. What were some of the challenges of the study? You talked about the, the pragmatic aspect of a registry um, as a platform for the trial. So that's a, a strength. It sort of makes it easier to execute trials using a registry. What were some of the challenges? You, you mentioned the pandemic. 
Yeah, we, we started to uh, enroll the first patient in, uh, in December 2020 mm -hmm. in the middle of the pandemic uh, and uh, that was in Sweden and then later on uh, we started enrollment in, in the UK also during the pandemic and because of the pragmatic nature of the, the trial we succeeded to enroll two patients per site per month on average mm -hmm. and that includes both large and, and smaller hospitals which gives this average, we, which we believe is, is rather successful, especially during a pandemic mm -hmm. where we had difficulties with resources for clinical trials. So, so in, by that, 4,000 patients uh, in, in two countries only, uh, and uh, in about 100 sites, that, that is a good result uh, for this register-based randomized controlled trial concept. Mm -hmm. And it's also the first double-blind study that we've done with this concept, we, which we've otherwise used for mostly academic trials in, in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Sweden certainly led the way in teaching us all how to run these registry-based trials, and you've accrued a tremendous body of evidence around these registries that you have. Um, it's quite a remarkable infrastructure. Do you have any parting words of wisdom? Anything you would have done differently in terms of the trial design? Yeah, thank you. Of course, we underestimated the low event rate. Mm -hmm. um, but th there are several reasons for it. One was the design of excluding high-risk patients, mm -hmm. of course, we should perhaps have anticipated that. The other was the, the, the effect of the pandemic, mm -hmm. that it was very infrequent to re patients hospitalized patients during the pandemic and post-pandemic because there are a lot of um, low resources and, and shortage of staff. Um, so that that's difficult to, to redesign. Mm -hmm. um, we could have done li the impact investigators doing the simi a similar trial with lymphocal and they and they are enriching very heavily for high-risk patients. So it's mm -hmm. a different ty type of trial. Uh, they will likely have a higher event rate. Mm -hmm. uh, our idea was to, you know, select low risk patients and make it very simple mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm happy with the way we did it mm -hmm. um, but I wished of course that we perhaps could have a higher event rate for the, right. for, for the best of the trial. So every trialist's but dream. Oh. Yeah, good for the patients. <laughs> good for the patients, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They were extremely well treated with <coughs> guidelines recommended treatments for post myocardial infarction patients and mm -hmm. that uh, that is, of course, also good for the patients, mm -hmm. but, but uh, more difficult for, for us trialists. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't talk about baseline characteristics, but tell me what your typical patient looked like. So, so uh, we, we had both ST elevation and non-ST elevation mm -hmm. uh, myocardial infarction patients, uh, mean age of, of approximately 63 years and 20% and females, which mm -hmm. is Little, little less Hello. than we we mm -hmm. we expected, uh, but but uh, rather typical for a myocardial infarction study anyway, with a lo smaller proportion of, of women. We try to encourage investigators to en enroll women uh, more more frequently, and of course, uh, no patients with with prior chronic heart failure and, and reduced ejection fraction. We actually used the DAPHF inclusion criteria to design this mm -hmm. study, so those patients already with an indication. Yeah, and, so and what was the mean EF in your trial? So about 80% of the patients had an EF below 50%, okay. but, but we allowed uh, patients with any, rena, uh, any left ventricular ejection fraction impairment mm -hmm. uh, in the study, so some patients had EF above 50%. Okay. Um, good. Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us about this trial. Congratulations on the execution of a very impactful uh, trial and your presentation here at AHA. And I hope to cross paths with you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us.